So as is usual around Christmas, I tend to get nostalgic and I try and Google around and see if there's any new developments on old games I like. And uh, one of the games I really liked when I was a kid was Ragnarok Online. I have only the most positive memories of it. And I know that it's not the best game, it's not the perfect game, but I have my reasons uh, for believing that it was a very good structured game and it had really good elements in it. And I want to try and explain on this channel why that is so. So what made Ragnarok so special and so enjoyable for many years that the current MMO simply can't uh, mimic. Uh, I'm playing uh, Final Fantasy XIV, uh, um, I played other MMOs and somehow, I know, I mean, Ragnarok Online is my first baby's MMO and I will always have the most fond memories of that time, but there is a, there, there's certain gameplay elements that I feel that are much better presented in Ragnarok and basically I'll try to explain why. And to even begin with the explanations, I first need to go into the troubled history of Ragnarok Online, how it was developed, what inspired it, and uh, well, from there on I'll try to explain how it changed and what elements I feel are way better in pre-Rebirth Ragnarok and how it compares to Rebirth and the new Korean uh, game that came out recently, Ragnarok Zero. So Gravity's story begins way back in 1994 when a small indie a game company called Artcraft Team worked together with Softmax to create a game called Likeness. It was a platformer for IBM compatibles and while they were working on it they also made Mole Man Wars, a small demo that was only distributed in newsgroups. Now after the success of Likeness the team split and a part of the team stayed with Softmax while well, another part of the team uh, together with Kim Hakyu, the creator of Ragnarok, formed a team called Team Gravity. So the newly founded Team Gravity joined up with SNT Entertainment for their first game called Lars the Wanderer that came out in 1995 for IBM compatibles. Lars was a mostly side-scrolling action platformer that had a few RPG elements and it also had a leveling system and true to its time it was a very difficult and grindy game. So after the success of Lars, they partnered together with Namelsoft to make their second game called Ant-Man 2 in 1998. The game was a fusion of Metal Slug and Gunstar Heroes, so a side-scrolling shooter game. I was pretty popular in Korea at the time. It never quite reached the fame or recognition of the games it copied, but it was still pretty okay. Oddly enough, it never was published in America, yet received a limited budget release in Germany, where it's pretty hard to find it today because of the low volume that it sold at. In 1998, while developing their next game called Arcturus, Kim Hakyu became the CEO of Gravity and decided to start a very ambitious project, but that project was still in its infancy. On December 21st, 2000, Gravity released a game called Arcturus Curse and Loss of Divinity, together with a famous Korean studio called Sonary. They were really famous for making RPGs, and this was another RPG co-developed with Gravity. Now if you look at the game, it looks kind of familiar, and that's because it's using the same engine that will later become the Ragnarok Online engine. The game itself uh, was pretty popular in Korea, uh, sold 25,000 copies uh, by the end of the month, and next month it sold 60,000. The game was published in Japan in 2003, sold 20,000 copies in three days. Now, the sad part about this game is that obviously a lot of people wanted to play it. And back in the day, if you remember Mirror Moon, they were really famous for doing the early visual novel translations. They decided to pick it up and their page can be still seen today where it was started, but unfortunately never finished. So before I start going into Ragnarok Online history, I want to clear something up. I think most people think that MMOs started with Ultima Online. Sure, there were well, there were a lot of games back then that could be classified as MMO. Some people say the first is Meridian, some say it's Legends of Kesmai. But there's an interesting game that came out in 1996 in Korea called Nexus The Kingdom of Winds. It looks really similar to Ultima Online and it has a lot of features you'd expect of an MMO. So Korean developers have been into the MMO for a very long time and a year later in 97 Ultima Online was released. But what 
a lot of people don't know is a year later, after that, a company called NCSoft released Lineage 1. And that was the premier MMO at that time in Korea. It was hugely successful. And a thing to note is a lot of people compared, like when I started playing uh, Ragnarok, people would say like Ragnarok is like anime Diablo 2. But you actually need to understand that it's more like anime Lineage 1. So finally we dive into the history of Ragnarok Online. Now from 1999 to 2001 I couldn't find much. I'm assuming maybe they had some previews in like magazines at the time or something in Korea. I'm not Korean so I couldn't dig them up but they were like Gravity was an independent studio. They had pr plenty of funds in 2000 from Arcturus and so the development of Ragnarok Online I'm assuming was going pretty swell. Now, in 2002, the first closed beta started popping up, and a lot of players were really excited about the game. And so, the game was progressing, they even expanded the betas to uh, US territories with Ragnarok International. But something happened in 2002 that would spell doom for the company, and it got a lot of players upset. So naturally, they wanted to transition at, for, from the uh, free model of closed betas to the pay-to-play model that was traditional at that time. And it seems that got a lot of people upset. Now, I can't, like, I, uh, from the sources I read, I can't tell you who it was. Maybe it was Fording or the Master Hackers or I don't know what exactly happened, but as the game went online, People started hacking, they were really unsatisfied, basically they said if I can't play at Ragnarok I'm gonna make it hell for everyone else. And so hacking attacks started to increase and in 2002 there was like late 2002 when the English second beta was starting there was an absolute massive attack on Gravity's headquarters. Now what, what you need to understand at that time there was like uh, very few companies that offer dedicated server hosting. So Gravity host hosted the Ragnarok servers in-house in their studio. Now that le left them extremely vulnerable to attacks, since if you found a backdoor into uh, the Ragnarok online servers, you could also connect to the local area network of their offices. And someone did that and executed a mass massive deleting attack, erasing countless like artwork, design concepts, game engine files, monsters, ideas, server software. A lot of the things were absolutely demolished and gone overnight. Now a lot of players from the international community will remember that the second closed beta abruptly came to an end and this is mostly because that was the only intact existing complete source files of the game. So Gravity hurried and tried to salvage and, and reconstruct as much as they could and they were up and running in a few months, but they lost months if not years of work. So later, with interviews and uh, some digging, people found out what was actually planned for Ragnarok Online before the hackers attacked. And if you see the feature list, it's kind of really sad that these are gone now. So they had plans to uh, implement housing and apartments for people around the cities. And they wanted to reduce loading times between maps to almost zero. They wanted larger maps, double the size of the maps they had currently. They also wanted satellite towns for every city. So uh, Islud was a satellite town to Prontera and Archer Village was uh, for Payon. They also wanted to add these kind of cities for Geffen, Morok, Juno, Alberta, Komodo, Aldebaran and so on. There was also a mercenary system planned they wanted to make an actual PvP arena, not the PvP that we later got, but something uh, more akin to if you play Tree of Savior, that kind of arena. Uh, there was also to be uh, third level classes, so after novice first level, second level, there was supposed to be a third level, and there's supposed to be additional like branches, so they wanted to make like a sorcerer for mages and rangers for swordsmen and so on. But all of that unfortunately was erased and development money was refocused elsewhere. 
So, with the company on its knees, having suffered a huge massive hacking attack, Gravity was now on its deathbed, spiraling into bankruptcy. And out of nowhere came Samsung, somehow having heard about this, and offered to bail them out. But Samsung had their own demands in the game, and they instated a guy named Kim Yogerum. I have no idea how to pronounce his name, so here's the name on the screen. So basically, Samsung offered to bail out Gravity, but it had its own ideas about the game, it wanted to make some money. Obviously. So in 2002, Kim Hakyu butted heads with Kim Yorgil and resigned from his CEO position uh, a few months later. Now, Korean gamers obviously speculated that this was due to Samsung interference or something. They probably had some kind of a huge fight. And in an open letter, Kim said uh, that this wasn't because of Samsung, etc. You know, the corporate bullshit that they did. And then just a few months later, he left to form his own company, IMC Games, and started on the MMO Grande Espada, taking uh, quite a few of the team that were working on uh, uh, Ragnarok Online at the time. Now, Ra Gravity, having faced this kind of an issue and not having released all their international servers, though, Samsung decided to franchise the whole Ragnarok Online server infrastructure to other people around the world. Now, this game, this is a big departure from their original plan, where they would make sister companies in different countries or regions, and then simply run their own servers. This time, these servers were under the management of local people that had no affiliation with Gravity, and they could do what they saw fit with the servers. Now, this later led to huge allegations of mismanagement, and there was a hacking scandal, etc. There was a lot of drama uh, regarding that, but... That's how they decided to do it, and the business model they decided to implement was pretty bad. Basically, you'd pay for the game, that was like an initial sum, and then later you would pay for expansion packs for the game, the so-called episodes. So every episode cost a huge amount of money, and depending on the server and how much population it had, this was a flat fee. So small servers couldn't afford to upgrade to bigger episodes, and therefore their revenue decreased as people bled out to private servers that were more up to date. And this problem became pretty obvious. There was one exception to that, and that was Japanese Ragnarok. They were offered a special model where they would pay some part of their income per player to Gravity, and they got everything for free. Other servers eventually joined that kind of model, but in the early years, this was the basically normal model Ragnarok Online had. Which meant that international Ragnarok, European Ragnarok and other servers located at throughout the world were vastly behind the actual Japanese and Korean servers, which led to people migrating to private servers for the more modern content and not having to pay anything. So with the fantastic business model that Samsung had uh, provided all the servers around the world and with the uh, implementation of the pay-to-play method that wasn't obviously popular with the players at the time because MMOs were pretty new and the idea of paying to play was kind of frowned upon, people very early started to emulate the server. So the first emulation efforts can be traced back to Japan, when the game on December 1st, 2002 went online and a lot of closed beta players were not satisfied that they would have to pay to play the game. Now, since the game was hacked, etc., there was probably some kind of files floating up there on the internet that they could snatch and they could obviously track the game from the uh, client and try to emulate what the server did. And so they did, and the early Athena server software was started to being developed in Japan, and the first private servers actually appeared in Japan around early 2003. So with the regards to piracy, obviously I'm going to mention that a whole lot in another episode, because it's like an essential part of Ragnarok history and I believe the vast majority of Ragnarok players actually started playing on pirated servers before they ever did on official ones, if they ever played on official ones. And I'm also one of these players. I'll tell my story on how I started to play the game uh, some other time. So this is the end of the first episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll be taking any critique you have or any corrections that you might spot. I mean, I did my research, but this is...
quite an extensive subject. I dug around a bit, but I didn't probably dig enough on some certain parts, so if anyone has any corrections, please leave them in the comments below.